I thought going into week two might be a rough weekend for the Pac-12, but they got one victory that they sorely needed, and USC showed a lot in their win against Stanford. They might have the best offense in the Pac-12. Let's go. Our Locked On Pac-12, your daily podcast on the Pac-12 Conference. It's the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Locked On Pac-12. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin, D1 play-by-play broadcaster. Thank you for making this your first listen or your first view of the day. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your number one source to stay up to date with the Conference of Champions, which is why, if you have not already, please like, comment, subscribe. Wherever you're listening to or watching this show, we're getting ever closer to 1,000 subscriptions on the YouTube channel, which I greatly appreciate. And today's episode is brought to you by Underdog Fantasy. Sign up on underdogfantasy.com with the promo code Locked On, two words, and get your first deposit doubled up to $100. There were highs, there were lows, there were some in-between areas for our beloved Conference of Champions over the weekend, and we're going to get to all of them as we will every Monday throughout the season. We've got winners, we've got losers, and we've got a lot of in-between. Everybody gets a uh, distinction here after their games, and uh, let's start with one of the biggest winners over the weekend, and that was USC. Question going in, yeah, you looked really good against Rice. How are you going to perform against a Power 5 school? That offense is ridiculous. They are performing at a very high level. I think higher, frankly, than maybe some USC fans expected. Maybe their expectations were higher than mine. I thought they would be good. It's not that they are are more explosive than I thought. It's how efficiently they operate. They're not turning the ball over. They don't have a whole lot of negative plays. The play calling is very smart and intuitive. Now, Lincoln Riley and Caleb Williams are clearly on the same page. They were talking about that a lot on uh, the broadcast over the weekend, Reese Davis and Kirk Herbstreet, and I think they were pretty right about that because Caleb Williams has this offense absolutely humming. And I think there are some good offenses in the Pac-12. Utah's, for the most part, has looked pretty good. They drubbed Southern Utah, an FCS school that is, you know, not on the same footing as them whatsoever. 73-7, to so not uh, too telling. But overall, I think their offense has looked good. UCLA can score uh, a lot of points as well. Oregon State led the Pac-12 in yards per play in 2021, for those of you who did not know it, about 6.4 per But USC has just got so many weapons. Brendan Rice, the Colorado transfer. The rating Boletnikoff winner, Jordan Addison. Mario Williams comes over from Oklahoma. They've got Terrell Bynum, who came down from uh, Washington as well. The running backs, Austin Jones, Travis Dye, both look really, really good. And they showed up the way you expected them to against a Power 5 or opponent, or at least the way USC fans were, were expecting and wanting them to against Stanford, they were firing on all cylinders. There, there's no other way to look at that offense other than saying, yeah, that looks like the best one in the Pac-12. I think Utah might be close, even though schematically they're very different, but the athletes that the Trojans have, the way they all get involved, too. I mean, you see Rice making a catch, and Addison's involved, and Williams is making plays, and the running backs are there. Lincoln Riley distributing the ball, and Caleb Williams facilitating as the head man for that offense, too, is really, really impressive this early in the season. And it, it makes USC a really scary team for everybody in the Pac-12 because you just don't know how you're going to stop them. I I don't know who's going to be able to slow them down first. Uh, They're not going to score this way in every single game, but they could be pretty darn close. Um, And I just say that because it's really hard for an offense to perform at that level, even Lincoln Riley's teams, every single week as you go throughout the course of a season. But they have an opportunity. They're number seven. They're the highest ranked team in in the Pac-12 right now. They have a schedule that would allow them although Notre Dame now is not going to be as good of a win uh, unless they really turn their season around. Cal gets them this week. Might be a Pac-12 prime pick. Uh, we'll, we'll have to just kind of wait and see how all those lines uh, shape out and such. But they've got a schedule that I think is good enough to where if they, certainly if they ran the table, they, they would get in. But I haven't, I, I, I've shifted my perception slightly about the offense. I'm like, okay, that's better sooner than I thought, right? This is what I expected USC to look like offensively at the end of the year, but they're clicking right now, and, and it looks quite good, and, and they showed it against a Pac-12 school, so I can say it with a lot more confidence than after week one against Rice. 
The other question I had about USC coming into the year was, how do you adjust the continuity? But the biggest one really was, what's the defense going to be like? And Stanford made this game a little closer than it was at the end. USC is forcing turnovers at a ridiculous rate right now. I, I don't know how sustainable that is. Stanford gave him a fumble. Well, I mean, it was a good hit by by the Trojans, but Stanford fumbled inside the red zone, threw an interception. McKee had another interception. That game could have been a lot closer. I think you have to feel mildly encouraged if you're Stanford with the way the team played. You just have to execute better in the red zone. They got down there and were just completely stuck, but that new RPO approach, it was interesting. I, I hadn't really seen anything like that before, and they waited to pull it out against USC they were not able to, to execute in key moments, which is why the game got away from them a little bit. But that USC defense is still got a ways to go. And I think Trojan fans saw that over the weekend against Stanford. EJ Smith had a lot of room to run. And there were a lot of big plays. And Stanford moved the ball. And it's not the most explosive offense USC is going to play this year. We'll see if they can make adjustments and improve as the year goes on. But I think USC right now, they've got the best offense in the Pac-12. I still think Utah is the best team because I trust that defense to come up with with a play more than USC's. I know the Trojans have been forcing a lot of turnovers, but there is an element of randomness to turnovers statistically, and you can't keep forcing them at this rate. They've been making plays, to their credit, and transfers like Shane Lee have been active. Mekhi Blackman had an interception in the end zone on, on fourth and goal against Stanford over the weekend. They've had guys step up when they needed them to, but I don't think you can force, you know, three to four turnovers a game, however many they're averaging with a couple pick sixes through the first couple weeks throughout the course of a 12-13 game season. It's just not a sustainable model. They've got to be able to improve on that side of the ball on a play-to-play basis. But if they can, then yes, they very well could win the Pac-12 this year because their offense doesn't look like it's going to get any worse. And barring an injury to Caleb Williams, that is that thing is going to just keep churning out points and yards uh, like the machine that it looks like right now. Just no, no, no lost momentum there. The other big winner from the weekend in the Pac-12, Washington State. How about this win by Jake Dickert and the Cougars? I didn't think they'd win it coming into this season. I didn't think they would win it going into last week because they just did not look very sharp week one against Idaho. And I understand that, right? I was in panic time. I'm saying, look, Cam Ward needs time. Jake Dickert's still a relatively new coach. You got a new offensive coordinator. Might just need time to really get things humming. But we have to perceptually change how we look at Washington State. All of us as Pac-12 fans. Because for a long time, they were a bottom dweller. Mike Leach gets there turns it around, makes them relevant, competitive, an 11-win season in 2018, had them as high as 8th nationally, uh, I believe, in the college football playoff rankings when they were 10-1 going into the Apple Cup and lost to a Chris Peterson Washington team, Washington team that went on to win the Pac-12 championship. We have to change how we think of Washington State because when all that happened with Mike Leach, they were doing what Mike Leach did on Saturday night down in Tucson, throw the ball around the field a million times, score a bunch of points, air it out, and just try to win shootouts and just outscore your opponent, right, on the offensive side. This is a defensively driven team. Jake Dickert was a defensive coordinator. He was the interim head coach. He's now the full-time head coach, and his team is taking on the personality of their head coach. And I've liked him for a while. I've sung his praises here on the show. This is even better than I thought they'd be able to, to perform from a level standpoint this early in the season. That is a heck of a win. That is a tough environment to play in. That is a darn good football team in Wisconsin that consistently wins 8 to 10 games a year in uh, the Big Ten, which, as we know, is a really good conference. And that is one heck of a win. More thoughts on Washington State coming after I remind you this episode brought to you by Underdog Fantasy. They've got an emphasis that is easy to get started and easy to play while you watch your favorite team play. You can win cold hard cash in a single game with investment backing from guys like Mark Cuban, Kevin Durant, Adam Schefter, and more. Their customer support team is top-notch. They're the best in the business. Sign up with the promo code Locked On. that's two words, and Underdog will double your first deposit up to $100. Deposit $100, get $100 free. Go to underdogfantasy.com or find the Underdog Fantasy app in the App Store or Google Play. That's Underdog Fantasy, promo code Locked On. Get in on the college football pick em action today. The Cougs are a defensively oriented team now. That's the way they are. And Cam Ward... 
needs to be better if they're going to have a truly special season, which maybe they're set up for right now. Nobody expected them to win that game. I certainly did it. Nobody in the national landscape really did. I don't even know if Washington State fans expected him to do that. I saw a video of a guy that said he'd carry old Crimson the flag up and down the street in his underwear if they won that game. Probably thinking, well, I'm not going to have to do that. But lo and behold, he was doing it. <laughs> it was awesome. The epitome of why college football is so great. Speaking of that uh, notion of why college football is so great, App State beating Texas A&M, the fans converging in the street, going nuts. Absolutely fantastic stuff. Had to shout out Appalachian State, their first top 10 win since 2007 when they uh, knocked off the Michigan Wolverines. What a game that was, we all remember. But this is such a statement win for Jake Dickert and Washington State. Absolutely huge. Absolutely huge. Probably the biggest win of his tenure, the Apple Cup last year. That's a big one because Washington State getting over the hump and doing it on the road emphatically, that was a real statement. But this one sets a new bar for for where Washington State's capable of going as a program with Dickert at the helm. It's the first ever ranked road Big Ten win in Washington State history. It's the first time they beat a ranked Big Ten team since 1994 against number 22 Illinois, and it's their first ranked win against anyone since 2018 when Mike Leach was the head coach, but they did it in such a different fashion and establishing an identity and a culture and getting guys to buy in so that you can win a football game this way. Mike Leach didn't win football games this way. And that's how a lot of people were probably thinking of Washington State is, oh, their defense is getting better and, you know, they're still going to need to score a bunch of points. That's not the case here. Now, maybe Wisconsin was just a good matchup for them because the Badgers are not known for their explosive athletes on the perimeter. But I tell you what, that was a heck of a defensive showing. They, they were good. They were physical up front. They were well coached. And they allowed just 14 points on the road in what is a jammed, packed Wisconsin home stadium. I mean, they put 70, 80,000 in the seats and they are loud. And Washington State went in there and they managed it. The question for them going forward is one that I had coming into the season. How does Cam Ward continue to progress? Because... He has not hit his ceiling, and not every player does, so it's not a guarantee. He has not hit his ceiling as a quarterback for Washington State through two games. He has not been the reason. They've won either of those games. It's been the defense battening down the hatches, tightening the screws, and making plays when they needed to and forcing turnovers when they needed to that have gotten them these two wins. And they play Colorado State this week. Should be an easy win. They'll be 3-0 and going into Pac-12 play. Or at least they should be, right? Can't afford to have an emotional letdown there. That's what Coach Dickert certainly is telling his team this week in practice leading up to the game. But that is such a big win for Washington State and a big win for the Pac-12. I talked about after week one, Pac-12 brand took a hit. I maintain that argument. It did. And is this having as wide-reaching ramifications as Utah's loss to Florida? No, because it wasn't as big of a stage, and it's Washington State. So you're not going to get quite as much attention from the national college football landscape as you would if the Utes, who were just in the Rose Bowl, or Oregon, or USC, or someone more well-known, or Washington as well, picked up a big-time win. But this is huge. To be able to go toe-to-toe with a, a good, solid Big Ten team on the road and walk out victorious, this is a celebratory mood that, that Washington State should be in this week. Fans, players, community, alumni, whoever, they should all be riding the high because that's a big-time win, and they should be able to get a win this week against Colorado State. And assuming they don't stumble in a major way, those good fives should carry over into Pac-12 play when they host Oregon. And if I'm the Ducks, I'd be pretty darn worried going up there to face that defense. They have to worry about BYU first this week, but... Man, that was a huge, huge, unexpected win for for Washington State, and they just grinded it out, and it was really awesome to see. The third winner of four over the weekend in the Pac-12, the Oregon State Beavers. I stayed up. I'm on Mountain Time. I'm currently based in the state of Utah. Past midnight, watching this game, and Oregon State really tried to give it away. <laughs> they, they, they did. You know, it was kind of teetering. It was back and forth. It was a great football game. It was a really, really good football game. And Oregon State got it done. And coming into the season, I thought they would split with the Mountain West schools. But after last week's performance, 
I flipped my pick and said, nope, I like them this week. I put them in the Pac-12 prime picks, part of a, a trio that went 3-0 this week. Get to that here in just a moment. But Oregon State, man, that that's a nice, nice win and then some. I mean, nice might even be underselling it. It's a fantastic win because they went and got it done on the road, a place where they never won as a program before, right? Washington State, historic with all the, the information and background there on, on the ranked Big Ten road victory. Oregon State as a team had never won in Fresno. They go down, beat a good Fresno State team that is a good Mountain West opponent, has got a Power 5 capable quarterback in Jake Hayner, who originally was at Washington. I thought he would come up with Kalen DeBoer. I was surprised when he didn't, but I've always liked him. That guy is an absolute baller. And the Oregon State defense faltered a little bit at times and kind of, you know, leaked back into some old habits that we saw a season ago when Tim Tibisar was still the defensive coordinator. But it was Chance Nolan on the offense that came through. And who else would finish this game for the Beavs but the best all-around college football player in the conference, and that's Jack Coletto. Guy plays linebacker, comes in as a Wildcat quarterback, and Jonathan Smith, how about the guts and the trust that Jonathan Smith has and has in his team to make that call? You get a pass interference in the end zone, three seconds left, ball at the two-yard line, you're down by three. There are a lot of coaches in college football that would kick that field goal and take overtime when you're on the road. But Jonathan Smith said, you know what? I trust my offensive coordinator, Brian Lindgren, who's really smart. And I trust our guys to go out there and execute. And we got one play to win the game. And it's in our control right now. And we can determine who wins right here, right now. And there was a little chess match with Jeff Tedford, the head coach for Fresno State on the other side, with the timeouts going back and forth. And Jonathan Smith sends his guys out there. Coletto powers it in. And the Beavs won an absolute thriller down in Fresno. Great, great start to the year. They've got Montana State, which is not an FCS team you want to sleep on. But with the way Oregon State is playing right now, they're going to be at home. I I have no doubts about them this weekend. They are not on upset alert whatsoever. Chance Nolan, maybe not his best game, right? He finished strong, played well when he needed to. But the offensive line, the running game was really strong. They got Musgrave involved late in the game. The Beavers got to clean up the drops. That has been a recurring theme through the first couple of weeks. But that's an upside, really, if you're an Oregon State fan. You're watching this offense play. You're running the ball well. Chance Nolan is pretty well protected. He's making throws when he needs to. Can still be a little more consistent, but overall was good again this week. Not Boise State good, but he was good again this week. And you've got receivers out there dropping balls that he's putting on the money left and right. And it's costing you first downs, opportunities to extend drives at critical junctures in the game. If they clean that up, the offense can take even another step forward, potentially. And Oregon State, an unquestioned winner of the weekend. It was those three teams really stood out above the rest and why they get the full on winners distinction here on Locked On Pac-12. Washington State, historic win. Oregon State, historic win. And USC, that offense is just going to be really hard to stop. It is going to be a prog- a problem for everybody in the Pac-12 this year, uh, as Stanford learned. And, you know, they've got uh, some solid players on the back end. Caillou Blue Kelly, all Pac-12 caliber corner, not enough. you, you got to have a lot of depth in your secondary, and your, your pass rush has got to be able to pressure Caleb Williams consistently, make him uncomfortable. Nobody's done that yet, and, and we'll see what, what Fresno State's got in store for the Trojans this week in L.A., but minus 14, that uh, might make it into the Pac-12 prime picks because I think USC could roll in that one after Fresno State got a gut punch in a game that they had won. They led late. Oregon State came right down the field with Chance Nolan and was able to, to execute. And that just feels like one of those games for the Beavs that they would have lost over over the last couple of seasons, right? They would have found a way to give it away. And it looked like there was a time when that was going to happen. When they allowed the big 40-yard reception and then the touchdown, it felt like that was maybe the opportunity where Oregon State fans were going to have some uh, some horrible flashbacks and uh, negative deja vu of like, oh gosh, this again, we're just barely going to lose. But this time, it, it, it feels a lot different. And, and the Bees got it done in a big way. Trojans and Cougars, good weekends for all of them.
What about everybody else? Everybody else got a label. Lean winner, lean loser. Who are the biggest losers of the weekend? I'll tell you after I remind you as you get it for fall. You need the right people on your team to help your small business fire on all cylinders. LinkedIn Jobs is here to make it easier to find the people you want to talk to faster and for free. Create a free job post in minutes on LinkedIn Jobs to reach your network and beyond to the world's largest professional network of over 810 million people. Did you know every week nearly 40 million job seekers visit LinkedIn? Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college that's linkedin.com slash locked on at college to post your job for free terms and conditions do apply everybody else in uh the pac 12 and i uh, would be remiss if i did not point out after a dreadful week one of the pac 12 prime picks we uh, rebounded with a resurgent week two and are at 500 on the year oh and three in week one a perfect three and over the weekend UNLV, I think this is probably my best individual game prediction yet to date. Um, I said, look, I think Cal's going to win, but I think it's going to be close, and I think they could be in trouble. And UNLV was driving down six late, and the Cal Bears defense came through, got a stop, and then they ran out the clock. But the uh, the Rebels covered the uh, 13 points. Oklahoma State minus 11 against Arizona State. They covered that as well. Looked like it was in doubt for a little while, but they ultimately win by 17. And then the Beavs. The Beavs finished it off. I had a minus one. I would have taken them. They opened plus one and a half. I would have loved that number, but uh, they, they swung back down to uh, a pick them. I was going to like them regardless. They got it done. Uh, so perfect 3 0 for the Pac 12 prime pick. So uh, you, you love to see that. But everybody else has uh, a label on how they performed this week. So let's get to them. Let's go with the uh, the lean win category. You got two teams here, one win and one lost. One is Washington. I saved the the top tier, the winners category for fans should be feeling really good and optimistic going forward and, and that you have tangible evidence to support the fact that you can feel good about where your football team is headed. And Washington is not in that category yet. They could get there this week, right? If they knock off at home Michigan State, then they could very they are, well, they would certainly be a, a massive winner, and they could have a very strong resurgent year under under Kalen DeBoer if that's the case. I don't anticipate that happening, but I got them in the lean win category here because yeah, they blew out Portland State, and you're supposed to. And last year, the loss to Montana at home was a forgettable moment for for Husky fans. This is an FCS opponent that's worse than than Montana by a good deal in Portland State. But there's a couple reasons I put them in the lean win category. Number one, you played two inferior opponents, but you beat them the way you're supposed to. And a year ago, that wasn't the case. That's improvement. That's growth. That's what you're looking for when you hire a, a new coach after after your team kind of bottoms out a little bit, as they did last year under under Jimmy Lake. But the other reason that I'm encouraged is you don't just have Michael Penix confident because of the stats he's put up going into this game uh, against Michigan State, which uh, could be highly competitive. And I know Seattle is going to sell that place out. But you've got Michael Penix healthy. It's been my biggest reserve with, with Washington and why I'm a little lower on him than other people, because I just can't see Penix playing a full season. I would love it if he did. Because the guy's battled injuries his entire career, but he's yet to play a full season. But you got through two games. The offense has been rolling. They're confident going into it. Yes, it'll be tougher against Michigan State, but you've got Michael Penix healthy. And if they can keep him upright, that's probably going to be the biggest key for him to to have success against what should be a pretty stingy defense from the Spartans and Michigan State with their head coach and, and Mel Tucker. But they've looked sharp literally from the first play of the season and beyond. And if you're Washington, that's what you're looking for to start the year. Like, it, it could not be off to a better start. Context is important because you've played Kent State and Portland State. And this Saturday Saturday will be the first major test. But so far, they, they could not have looked that much better. I also put Arizona in the lean win category here. I know they lost 39-17, to 17, and that was the final score. But they battled. And they're playing an SEC opponent in Mississippi State. That's a solid team. Right, that could be an eight, maybe nine win SEC team, depending on how the Egg Bowl goals against Egg Bowl goes uh, at the end of the year against Ole Miss. Um, I think Jaden Delora w- was trying a little too hard in this game. Right, he can do some great things. I'm a Jaden Delora fan, but I also said coming into the year. I couldn't pick Arizona to be a 6-7 win team because he does need some semblance of a balanced team around him. He's not going to just carry you to wins. And he tried his hardest to carry his team to a win in this game, but it was to their detriment at times. 
But still, the final score here did not indicate how close this was. They were battling, they were competing, and they put up a good, solid fight. Not amazing, not great, not spectacular, but overall, I think if you're Arizona, you have to feel confident going into an FCS game this week against North Dakota State at your chances of being 2-1 and one going into conference play, which is all you could really ask for when you're over-under coming into the season is 2.5. And, a half. and they, they got the win against San Diego State. That was important, and putting up a solid fight there. I think you still have to feel optimistic about where Arizona is going there under Jed Fish in year two. Um, before we get to the negatives, no opinion on three teams this week. Cal, Oregon, UCLA. Now, the Ducks and UCLA, both better than last week, right? UCLA started fast. They didn't have a deficit or anything, but you're playing FCS school that doesn't have the bodies or the dogs to keep up with you. You should win that game. And you did. You should win it big. And they both did. No opinion. Move on. Cal. I I thought they would win and not cover. They won and didn't cover. Now, just because I expected that doesn't mean it's great news, but it's also not bad news, right? It's good news that you won. So you got a couple wins going into this week's matchup with Notre Dame on the road. Um, But on the flip side, it's a bottom tier Mountain West school. You're at home and they were driving for the win at the end of the game. It's suboptimal, but it's also kind of what I expected from Cal coming into the year. Uh, Lean lose this week, Stanford and Arizona State. Um, I can't put Stanford in the full-on loser category because they couldn't stop USC. I'm not sure who's going to, um, but the defense was abysmal for the Cardinal. However, the offense moved the ball, and that was a problem a year ago, and they've retooled their offensive philosophy and approach to become very RPO-centric, and they were creating chunk plays. They need to execute better in the red zone because they turned the ball over. I think they had three trips inside the red zone that yielded zero points combined. So that was the difference in the game, to be sure. But if you're a Stanford fan, that's kind of a, a legitimate thing to grab onto and say, all right, that was at least encouraging. Let's see if we can carry it over to the next week and the week after that. Uh, and their next Pac-12 opponent is, is Washington in a couple weeks up in Seattle. If they could go up and move the ball, win that game, then you'd probably feel good about where they're headed. Um, but the defense, which struggled mightily a season ago, was bad. Are they going to be that bad every week? No, because they're not playing USC every week with the sort of weapons that the Trojans have gotten via the transfer portal. But... There were some good things on offense, but overall, you you lose the game, one that was certainly winnable, and they just didn't execute to hang around, and USC did. That's what it came down to, execution in key moments. Uh, But, you know, not full-on loser of the week because they they did do uh, some good things on offense. Arizona State, again, not full-on loser because they were supposed to lose. Right. So this is, you know, you got five different categories that, that I'm putting teams into here. Winners, lean win, no opinion, lean lose and the losers of the weekend. I've got Arizona State here because they didn't play a terrible game. They didn't play a great game, right? Oklahoma State covered, but it wasn't a blowout. It wasn't a rout. You know, they, they hung around for a, a little bit. They were just, I think, not as good as the other team. And, and that's okay. It's not great that you lost the game. Of course, you would have liked to have pulled an upset the way Washington State did and kind of changed the, the narrative surrounding your program right now. But... It was not the worst showing. It just wasn't a great showing. Uh, the Arizona State offense, only 17 points, not not able to get a whole lot going there. Uh, and we close with our, our two losers of the week. And these do have an order. Um, the biggest loser of the week is Colorado. That seat underneath Carl Durrell is heating up on a weekly basis. And coming into the year, I was inclined to say, look, even if this year goes poorly, if you win uh, three games or so, then, and I only thought they would win one, kind of looks like I might be right, but still early, still time for things to change, but they went on the road, took on Air Force, big underdog, and they got trounced again, and I was inclined coming into the year to give them time, say, new offensive staff, give them two seasons, see if they can show some signs, but they're just showing no signs of life right now, and if they keep getting, they're a 26 and a half, 27 and a half point underdog right now, as I record this on Sunday afternoon, against Minnesota on the road, they will lose that game. Might be another blowout. And if it is, the the pressure might intensify there. They could do well, or Carl Durrell could do himself a couple favors by having a strong showing uh, over there in Minnesota against P.J. Fleck. I, uh, yeah, I don't, I, I don't see that. But uh, finally, 
Who am I leaving out? Oh, yeah, that's right, Utah. Yeah, Utah a loser this week. I know they won on the field, but that doesn't mean you're automatically a winner, and losing doesn't mean you're automatically a loser. This week here on Locked on Pac-12, why is Florida a loser, you ask, when they won 73-7, to and they beat the bejesus out of Southern Utah, a game that I was calling for the Thunderbirds on uh, the radio, doing some color commentary there. Why would Utah be a loser? Because Florida lost. They lost to number 20, Kentucky, a good solid team. But that doesn't bode well for how Florida is going to perform the rest of the year. And I said after the loss in week one for the Utes down in Gainesville, every Utah fan needed to be a Florida fan. And Florida lost. So does that mean that it's over for Utah? No. The Gators could still, you know, turn it on and finish 9-3 and three in the regular season or 8-4. and four. But if you're not able to beat Kentucky, that's kind of an upstart on the rise SEC team or so. How many other wins is Florida going to have on their schedule? And if they, would, if they have six or seven wins again, then it's a really bad look for Utah. So every time Florida loses... It's a loss for Utah because they lost that game or else it wouldn't matter as much. But unfortunately for the Utes, it does. Appreciate everyone listening. See you next time and have a wonderful rest of your day.